So yeah, the guy who popularized snake handling, Moonshiner who died by snake bite. So George Henley is born 1880, he's born to a Baptist family. His mom and sister are both really religious. So he's young and he gets taken along to this revival meeting in some coal mine in Tennessee. He saw some old lady handling a snake and he's like, holy shit, this is the coolest thing I've ever seen. Why don't more Christians do this? So in case you're wondering why this lady was waving a snake, Pentecostals emerging out of the holiness movement often had an emphasis on signs and wonders accompanying those who believe. One set of verses often pointed to is the end of Mark 16, which includes, amongst other things, verse 18, they shall pick up snakes. This left a lasting impression on him. Just, you know, the religious conviction part didn't, because he left the church by the time he was 20 and got married, became a moonshiner, just worked labor jobs till He'd have a new religious awakening and decide, you know, I gotta distance myself from my old friends. There are other people that want worldly things like baseball or lipstick and drinking, despite being a moonshiner. He claimed to have an experience of God where God called him out to the wilderness. And he saw a snake, he picks it up, and cause God commands him to, and he carries it into a church. So he becomes a traveling preacher. His theology makes sense within its own context. He read that whole thing of wonders accompanying those who believe as not so much these will follow, but these are things you have to do. So it's not that Christians can carry snakes, it's that real Christians will carry and shake snakes. And if they drink poison, they'll be fine. That one gets an if, but the snakes, you gotta do that. Or else you're barely a Christian at all. But theologically, it's not that far off of where Pentecostalism was at the time. They just chose a very specific verse to focus on. Just so you know, most scholars think the end of Mark is probably tacked on. Early manuscripts of Mark just have it end after Jesus dies. But this still fits with the theological motif of the longer ending of Mark, which is life triumphing over death. Jesus gets resurrected, and all these symbols of death, whether poison, disease, snakes, aren't going to affect the new Christian. So, they're staying pretty consistent with the theme of the extended gospel. Plus, there's that whole snake in the Garden of Eden situation. So yeah, snakes are generally seen as a symbol of evil. In 1915, despite being illiterate, he became a preacher. That's right. He got his wife to read, and then, you know, he would sermonize on whatever she read. He's not all about this book learning. He has Holy Spirit telling him what's right. Snake handling peaks in popularity in the 1920s. And he becomes really popular. People are really impressed with his very charismatic style of lively music, passionate preaching, and snakes. Waving of snakes. But alas, seven years later, 1922, he's forced to resign for personal reasons. Later turned out him and his wife were getting a divorce because he was a drunk with anger problems. Remember, he's actually against alcohol. A year later, he was arrested for moonshining. And when given the option of going to jail or going to a workhouse, he chose the workhouse. Then is assigned to a chain gang and pretty nice guy. As time goes on, he ends up getting easier and easier duties. Then one day, when the guards send him out to go fetch a pail of water, he runs. He runs to Ohio and hides out with his sister. There he resumed preaching and now had her to read, so you know, problem solved. 1926, a family who was concerned that their daughter was suffering from a curse summoned him to see if he could remove the curse. And a year later, they were wed. Later, he would start touring, was capable of attracting crowds of hundreds of people. But often, he was controversial. There's this one time where a 12-year-old kid tore the head off a snake in one of his meetings, and it was like 500 people and a riot breaks out. Yeah, papers weren't too thrilled with that. I think that was in Virginia? And there's this other time when he's in Florida. And there's this 27-year-old strawberry picker who ends up getting bit by the snake. And he tells the newspaper, the only reason he got bit was because he lacked faith. And don't worry, God has shown me he will recover. And, and then the kid dies. And the town all really kind of hates him. So lucky for Hensley that the coroner determines that it was the kid's own fault for being stupid enough to handle a snake. So that worked in his favor. And the state ends up burying him because the guy was so poor they didn't want to put any pressure on the family. And Hensley decides that the best idea is probably to do the funeral to try easing tensions and then get the heck out. As a reaction to this, people start making it illegal to handle snakes that aren't in a container. 
And Hensley starts to view these legal troubles with laws against snake handling and moonshining as his Christian persecution. And George wants to keep on touring, but his wife's not so thrilled with that idea. She, you know, wanted to be in a stable place and for him to have a stable job for a change. Because, you know, they had kids and responsibilities. George's response? We should put those kids in an orphanage. Her response? We should get a divorce. In case you were curious, basically all his kids hate him. He remarries two more times and founds a church with someone who follows in his footsteps. But snake handling is in the decline. It's not as cool as it once was. But this church would have its own issues as a congregation member also died of a snake bite. And the theology regarding what it means when you get bit starts to switch a little. They don't view his death as him lacking faith, but rather God testing the faith of the congregation and also trying to make sure it's clear to everyone that these snakes actually can kill people. Plus, they continue to snake handle even at the guy's funeral. That's dedication. I was born a snake handler and I'll die a snake handler. And while it's easy to kind of pick on these guys, being like, well, isn't that convenient that your theology is changing that way? People always struggle with these kind of ideas of why a death occurred. And so I think it's kind of unfair when we pick on their theology for, like, conveniently shifting, because I think that happens in a lot of churches. We always are trying to find meaning in that, God's place, whether he wanted that to happen, whether it's part of his plan, or whether it's just a tragedy. But in 1955, in his autumn years, one day while preaching, would be bit himself. Those in the crowd, including the sheriff of the area, told him, you know what, you should probably go to the hospital, but, you know, he saw that as not trusting God. So he just continued to preach, swelling up and vomiting blood, and eventually dying. One witness said as he lay dying that he condemned the congregation for their lack of faith being what was killing him. His wife would say that she hadn't lost any faith over the ordeal, but rather that she would continue to teach snake handling. So as for a drink, originally I was thinking the snake bite, but the shot variation changes too much by region usually consisting of some combination of whiskey, tequila, Tabasco, or an herbal liqueur like Chartreuse or Jägermeister. The drink version of a snake bite is a combination of lager and cider, but it's too much of a United Kingdom drink for this one. Rather, I went with moonshine, a popular drink among the poor people of the Appalachian Mountains, made with corn mash and a big part of George Hensley's life. <sighs> Why? It's not even that strong, it's just gross tasting. 